Welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, session of interview with the experts. I'm delighted to have my uh, friend and uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Maggie Redfield. She's a heart failure uh, specialist in our Department of uh, Cardiovascular uh, uh, Medicine. She's also um, a professor of medicine and the former chair of our Division of Circuitry Failure. So welcome, Maggie. Nice to be here, Malcolm. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about an incredibly uh, important uh, group of uh, drugs, uh, the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, but uh, particularly with uh, respect to the treatment of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We're, we're aware that there are some other indications for these drugs, but the patients with uh, HEFREF, uh, the, uh, the, the topic for today. So maybe I'll just uh, have you start and, and, and tell us what is the evidence that we should be using these drugs uh, in this group of patients? Well, I think uh, that's a great question. And the evidence is really overwhelming. I can't think of a medication that so quickly amassed such a body of evidence for its use. So when we're talking about its use in heart failure with reduced EF, we're talking about 40% or below. And First and foremost, we know that these, this class of drugs prevent heart failure uh, with empagliflozin, uh, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin. In diabetics, three huge trials. In diabetics, most without heart failure, 90% didn't have heart failure. Just high-risk diabetics, use of these drugs produced a consistent, I mean, it was almost identical in each of those three trials reduction in incidence of heart failure. Uh, over 35,000 patients in these three trials, and it was highly significant reduction in new heart failure. Um, and we got a lot of information about safety of these drugs and tolerance of those drugs from those prevention trials. Then of course, now we have three trials presented within a year, essentially, three trials in heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. And these three trials, two of them enrolled both diabetics and non-diabetics. That's the DAPA-HF trial with dapagliflozin and the emperor reduced trial with empagliflozin. And then there was the soloist worsening heart failure, which was with sologliflozin, which is actually an SGLT1 and 2 inhibitor. And that one was in hospitalized heart failure patients with diabetes. So three trials and a big meta-analysis of all three of these trials published in the European Journal of Heart Failure. And what those three trials showed was, again, incredibly consistent findings of reduction in the primary endpoints of heart failure hospitalizations or cardiovascular death. Um, it was a very dramatic reduction and also analyzed each component of the primary endpoint and showed that it reduced hospitalizations reduced cardiovascular death, and very, very importantly, reduced all-cause mortality with these agents. Now, in these trials, you had to have systolic heart failure. Um, as I said, could be diabetic or non-diabetic. Um, had to have an EF less than or equal to 40%. Had to have a GFR of above 30. And all three trials had an antiprobe and pre-entry criteria that they had to be above about 600 in science rhythm, above about 900 in AFib. And you had to have a blood pressure of around 95 to 100 to get in. Um, and again, very consistent findings. So now ESC guidelines recommend their use in HEFREF. The ACC guidelines are being redone, uh, but an ACC expert consensus document recommends their use. And of course, empagliflozin and dapagliflozin are both labeled for HEFREF. So really a, a compelling story of benefit. Yeah, thank you for that uh, summary. And just going back to uh, your earlier comment about, you know, the, the, you know, just the amount of data we have supporting this. And, and if I remember correctly, I mean, these started off really as uh, diabetic drugs and the uh, cardiovascular benefits were almost sort of serendipitous uh, in terms of just proving safety, but they've sort of had an explosion of their own indication since then. And Yeah. If you go back and read the protocols for those three big prevention trials, they don't even mention heart failure. They all collected data, but they 
it was all focused on ischemic events. So I guess it shows that even today, accidents still happen. <laughs> Yeah, and as you said, you know, you couldn't remember, uh, you know, a time that, uh, or, or maybe another drug or intervention that's uh, had, you know, so much, you know, um, you know, published on it, and maybe you know, future impact. And, you know, would we be going too far to say that this is, you know, maybe just reminiscent of the, uh, the effect that statins had, you know, over the last twenty years have just changed the uh, the landscape of uh, yes. atherosclerotic uh, disease and outcome. And uh, it's like a no-brainer that you're going to be on a statin, and it really um, it has just really had a major, I guess, effect and revolution on just how we treat patients with cardiovascular disease. Do you see these uh, uh, this class of drugs maybe having similar impact? Yes, not so much on uh, atherosclerotic disease, but on heart failure and on renal failure, which, as you well know, uh, goes hand in hand with heart failure. And so the fact that these drugs have also been shown to improve uh, renal function and, and decrease adverse renal outcomes, uh, really, it is sort of like a new and different statin. I agree. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, I think our listeners are going to be very interested in, you know, uh, how do you start this, uh, you know, uh, medication. But before we do that, maybe just very briefly, I mean, who are the patients that we would not consider uh, this? And, and hopefully this is a relatively small group, but right. maybe we could just dispense with that very quickly. One thing, what we're always afraid of in heart failure is, are we going to drop the blood pressure? And these medications have very little impact on blood pressure. So you don't have to worry so much about that, although the trials had an entry criteria of 95 to 100. Uh, most people would probably maybe go down to 90. Um, they obviously cause loss of glucose, which produces an osmotic diuresis and sodium in the urine. And most of the patients in the trials were fairly well compensated. So patients can get dehydrated on these. So you got to make sure they have adequate fluid intake. And then we check a set of electrolytes within two weeks of initiating them. The Not for use in type ones, not for use in type twos with a history of DKA. You have to have the GFR above 30. Um, and the two things that come up are UTIs because you're losing sugar in your urine. So it makes it a better culture media. Um, so, you know, elderly women with a lot of urinary tract infections, you gotta be very careful with them and stay on top of it. And then there's this really rare necrotizing perineal fasciitis that can happen, but it's super rare, less than 1%. And it wasn't significantly different in, in these cardiovascular trials in placebo versus uh, SGLT2 inhibitor treated patients. So that's the main thing, not type one, adequate renal function, um, and talk about the perineal and the urine, fasciitis and the urinary tract infections, make sure your patients are looking out for that. No, I, I, I may be mistaken here, but I, I thought that these drugs had been used in patients who have type 1 diabetes, uh, who are an agent, not the heart failure patients, but in the diabetic population, are they not using that? Do we, uh... No, not so much because, um, you know, if you have an insulin deficiency um, and you're losing, you know, sugar via a different way, they can cause a propensity to DKA. So, no, not, not for type 1s. But it could be type two low who's on insulin, of course. Yeah, it, insulin doesn't matter. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So now let, let's uh, say you're seeing a patient in the outpatient clinic you know, today, and uh -huh. uh, and let's say has has established heart failure, right? Uh, systolic heart failure, and is on you know, the the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, etc. Um, is this a patient that you're now interested in starting uh, one of these agents? And if so. How would you do it? Or and then maybe just address the, the question of is there any titration required? Uh, what sort of things are you looking for uh, right. in these patients? Well, where are you going to see heart failure patients? The first one is the scenario you presented outpatient on your best, first of all, uh, guideline directed medical therapy, beta blockers, some sort of RAS antagonist, hopefully in Tresto, uh, if they can afford it and then aldactone antagonist if they can afford that. Then if you're seeing a patient like that, remember 75% uh, of the patients in the trials were class two. So doing pretty well, class one or two. So just because they're doing well, that's exactly the patient you should start. So yes, everybody in that scenario 
who meet the guidelines should be started. In non-diabetics, you just start it. 10 milligrams of DAPA, 10 milligrams of EMPA. You review the side effects. We check an electrolyte panel in two weeks. You're good to go. Um, now, what's the other scenario? You might be in the outpatient setting, seeing a patient with systolic heart failure who you're still up titrating. There's a cogent argument to um, just going ahead and starting it anyway. You know, more uh, emphasis is now being placed on rather than waiting till you get the RAS antagonist, the beta blocker, and the aldosterone, and then add dapagliflozin. Some people are really arguing, or, or empagliflozin. Some people are really arguing that you should do it right away. So that's. We'll wait and see what the guidelines say, but there are several position papers that are advancing that, that even if you're not finished up titrating, go ahead and add it in. And then the third and the most important, I think, uh, scenario is you're in the hospital. And well, you're- Before we get to the hospital, Maggie, let's okay. just, because I think that you're right. really important practical advice you're giving here. So again, that patient that you're actually initiating a treatment uh, with ACE inhibitors, diuretics, you know, um, and the other drugs that you mentioned there, uh, what you're saying here, I mean, particularly is it's not really going to uh, affect their blood pressure, which most of those other drugs do. Uh, maybe you do start it there. You don't have to wait and bring them back and a few months later and uh, tolerate right. them here. And, then, and of course, one of the things that goes to that argument is, well, in the trials, everybody was on excellent guideline-directed medical therapy, so you should always do that. But the question is, uh, do you have to wait until you're done? And, and that's an area that the guidelines will have to address, sure. um, but now, you could consider the, adding well, it in early. But this was in the non-diabetic patient. Now, what about right. if the patient has diabetes? is uh, on metformin or insulin uh, mm -hmm. looked after by a diabetic specialist. Is this a drug that you're going to feel comfortable starting yourself or it, are you going to wait for the diabetic specialist to do it? Or is there some other way we could uh, make sure that this that patient's not going to miss out on the benefits of this drug? That's a great, great point. And I think it's important to communicate with whoever is managing the patient's diabetes. Um, and if the patient is well controlled, if they're on metformin and another oral agent, a different uh, type of oral agent, um, you can stop the other oral agent and add it to the metformin. That's a pretty clear, uh, but you really got to communicate to it with whoever is um, managing uh, the diabetes. Um, so let's move to the inpatient practice then. Uh, that's obviously where you know we see a lot of these patients. You know, mm -hmm. um, very often with you, uh, you know, acute and chronic, you know, decompensation of, of their heart failure or a new diagnosis of acute heart failure. Mm -hmm. Well, if the patient's in with decompensation or an, or new onset, uh, we didn't get to delve into the specific trials, but that SOLAS trial, which was hospitalized diabetic with heart failure. Starting it there, regardless of the F in that trial, but it was mostly half breath, uh, and regardless of background therapy, resulted in a number needed to treat of only four. four. And analysis of all these trials, the soloist and the other trials, you start to see the statistically significant impact on the primary outcome within a month. And the primary outcome, just to remind everyone? In most cases, it was cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death and heart failure rehospitalization. So, you know, therapeutic inertia is something really to avoid here uh, because the effects come on fast um, and a very small number needed to treat. And it's the people who are in the hospital who are obviously at the highest risk of rehospitalization. So, you know, we're really working hard. And it is difficult because you don't know if the patient's insurance will pay for it. So you've got to write a prescription for them, have them, you know, contact the pharmacist at their fulfilling uh, uh, pharmacy and see what their copay is and see if they can be afford to be on it because. That's really a window of opportunity to have the biggest impact. 
Do you see um, your continued hesitation then among cardiologists in prescribing these drugs? And, and what can we do to overcome that uh, therapeutic inertia as you uh, yes. Well, uh, there always is therapeutic inertia, um, and we just need to do better uh, with these class of drugs. And it, the big thing is the cost for the patients. Um, the therapeutic inertia for the physicians, I think, is maybe some hesitancy about a diabetic drug or saying, well, they're doing pretty well, you know, but that's what we have to emphasize is that, yeah, those are the patients who are in the trials who obtain so much benefit. The number needed to treat for not the hospitalized patients, but the patients enrolled as, as uh, outpatients was only 15 to 20. So that's pretty low for an NNT. Yeah. The cost of these is kind of about like Entresto. Not everybody's insurance will pay for it, but uh, I think the roll-in is going much more smoothly than it did for Entresto. We're getting fewer turndowns uh, as the experience with it grows. So as, as I attempt to summarize this then, so we've, we've got this new class of agents have very powerful uh, you know, effects, uh, particularly on uh, cardiovascular outcomes in terms of uh, hospitalization for heart failure, mortality. I mean, these are you know, really strong you know, endpoints. You know, and then that hospital population, a number needed to treat of only four, uh, is that's something that should always get our attention. Yes. <laughs> that's, uh, that's something that's uh, you know, incredibly important to understand. Um, for the non-diabetic uh, patients, uh, whether they're in the hospital or the outpatients, this should be pretty easy for us to uh, prescribe, and we should start doing that. The ones who are diabetic, and again, just to clarify, these are type 2 diabetics, whether or not they're on insulin, and, uh, and these benefits apply to those who are diabetic and non-diabetic, uh, but the diabetic patients, we probably have to have close communication with the diabetic uh, specialist. Um, I'm not sure if they're suffering from any uh, therapeutic inertia in these patients. You, you may want to make a comment there, uh, but uh, but regardless, I think communication is going to be very, very important. Uh, anything you want to add uh, maybe before we uh, wrap up here? That's a great summary. I think the only other thing I would uh, emphasize is that this is an easy one. No of titration, um, very good safety profile, maybe just a set of, di of electrolytes two weeks after starting. Uh, compared to what we go through with beta blockers and RAS antagonists and aldosterone, this should be easy. Um, and then the diabetics, there is already the ESC uh, recommend SGLT2 as first line agent. Uh, we don't know yet what this side of the Atlantic will recommend as far as unselected you know, patients with diabetes, but um, I, our diabetic specialists have been good to work with, and uh, you know most of the primary care providers are managing the diabetes, uh, and they're very open to this. Just what, takes a phone call. Yeah, and one final practical question: in the patient uh, who ends up getting admitted to the cardiac intensive care unit, pulmonary edema, um, you know whether or not they've uh, had a history of heart failure in the past, but has DKA. Um, and maybe this is the first time they're presented with DKA. Is this a patient that you would hold off starting this? Absolutely, and yeah. It's group it? ones and group twos who are prone to DKA. You would definitely uh, want a diabetologist involved if you're even going to consider it. Thank you so much. Maggie, uh, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Uh, you're such an expert in the field of uh, heart failure, and uh, we're very... Uh, um, very fortunate to, ha to have you uh, discuss this topic with us today. And I think our listeners and viewers will really appreciate the, uh, uh, the information that you've uh, shared with us today. So thank you so much for your time. All right. Have a great day, Malcolm.